This is John Wetton Vesha. You're listening to Backbeat with Andre Graziati. All music is the same. It's just a new set of lyrics and a new backbeat. Uh, Andre Graziati here for the Backbeat Experience in a chat with John Wetton. Thank you for taking some time out to have a chat today. Very welcome. Um, What was your introduction to music? Was it from your family background? Or what was your first introduction to music? Uh, Classical music. My my brother is a church organist. Okay. And uh, I'm looking forward to going to Leipzig in a couple of couple of days' time. For what reason? The Bach Museum in there. Oh, okay. Maybe get a chance to have a look around that. My brother is a church organist, still is. Right. Still is. Um, and so he is seven years older than I am. So from the age of about six, five or six, I had organ music, whether it played on the piano or um, recorded music, mm-hmm. floating around the house. And I learned... I learned all the stuff, I learned to play all the stuff. He would, because there are no bass pedals on a piano, he would ask me to play the bass parts, uh, read the bass parts to, to a, uh, an organ piece. <coughs> and I got fascinated by the relationship between the bass, the melody line, and the chords within the chords. And that's still really my fascination. To today. this day. Yeah. To this day. Uh, that is what turns me on more than anything about standing in the middle of that fucking lot out there <laughs> is hearing the whole thing right. in Technicolor. Uh-huh. It's just mind-blowing. And when people say, why are you doing this? Then I mean, you have to stand in the middle of it just once to find out what it's like. It's to get the full effect. Absolutely effects. incredible. Yeah. Absolutely incredible. And you hear it there in all this. You can, you can see all the parts. Uh, it's just gorgeous. And that's what fascinated me about music to start with, yeah. and, and it still does. Uh, if you listen to, say, anything from me in King Crimson, from me in UK, or me in Asia, you can hear the same sort of influence in the in the way the chords are, and the bass line links with the with the top line either in parallel or contrapuntally. Uh, when I decided that I was never going to be as good as my brother church music, that was his vocation, not mine, and I decided to change tack. Uh, there were kids at school playing guitars, right. and I thought, okay, well, I'll give that a go now. Uh, piano is my first instrument. Okay. So Hard, difficult made, to carry with you, but... Yeah, indeed. So I made the jump, and they didn't have little portable keyboards. Back then, no. Uh, so I made the jump and, um, and got into guitar, but all of this, all the guitar music at that time was fairly sort of two-dimensional. Mm. It was... It was Elvis, it was uh, The Ventures, it was um, The Shadows in Britain. Um, uh, it got the tunes, but <laughs> it hadn't really come to fruition. Right. Nothing had really ignited. It was kind of boring and yes. fairly tedious production-wise. So harmonically, it was nowhere. Right. Nowhere. Absolutely zero. No, zero interest from me at all. But along came... The Beatles, along came the Beach Boys, and along came like Brooklyn Harum, and that big explosion in London suddenly happened, and that was, in, you know, in the late sixties, suddenly London was the place to be, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, there were some extremely good bands that you could see for a buck. You could go to the Marquee and you could see King Crimson, you could see the Moody Blues, you could see. Purple Harem, you could see the nice. What a time that was! It was, and you could you pay your money, no, one dollar, you know, no, fifty p. Wow! On the door and go in and see Jess Rotel, and Pink Floyd, uh-huh. or any of the names of a sort of household today. And it was a great time to be in London. London was like a village. It was very small. Everybody went to the same pubs. They went to the same clubs, and everybody knew about gigs going. So it was a good time to be there. And for me, the fascination with um, with melody and harmony came together with King Crimson. I, I did a, a few gigs before that. I, I joined Family, which was a kind of a cult mm-hmm. band. A cult band, not right. a cult band. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and the, that sort of got me in front of a, an audience. Then the next step was for me to to sing in front of, a, you know, to be the... Did that come easy? Uh, that's sort of something I always did. Because I had this fascination with the melody and the bass line, yeah. I became a kind of singing bass player. That, and uh, in that grand tradition of, of singing bass players. And the bands that I loved at that time, most of them had singing bass players. The Beach Boys, had Brian Wilson, 
Beatles had Paul McCartney, and uh, that seemed to me like the, the the bass seemed to be a sort of perfect prop if you were a singer writer. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and then I, I, I joined King Crimson, which was kind of my, my dream job, really. They came, uh, Robert Fripp comes from the same part of the country right. that I grew up in. I wasn't born there, but I grew up in Bournemouth. And uh, so that lasted for three years, and I wanted it to last for 23 years, and it didn't. So it never does, apparently. Uh -huh. So um, after that, I, kinda, I wanted to form a band. Uh, I'm giving you the history. Well, UK, you came, UK came up. UK came up. UK, UK was the, was was the next attempt to reform a King Crimson type okay. band. And it Which went to came, albums and then... Yeah, it went to albums and it went tits up. But I think that the first album was absolutely spectacular. Uh -huh. you know, because it ended up being more than a, a King Crimson recreation. It just took on its own life. And it ended up being a sort of fusion type thing, which, which actually was fairly groundbreaking mm -hmm. in its day. Uh, I got the feeling with UK though that, that I was I'm close but no cigar. That there was something else around the corner. Mm -hmm. that, that, and I was aided and abetted. I was encouraged by a, an A and R man from at that time Atlantic Records. He, he kind of um, groomed me for right. about six years. Uh, he kept uh, wanting to hear songs that I'd written and people I was talking to. And, stuff. and when I came along with Asia, he went, "Yeah, it's okay. Okay, you got it. That's it." Let's go. And um, by that time, he'd just moved from Atlantic to Geffen Records. And it all kind of all fell into place. Beginning of a new decade, mm -hmm. MTV, a new record company. So that was a new band. That was that huge launch pad for you. Yeah, it was. Yeah, massive, massive. I mean, I remember back in 1982 in Montreal uh, when Sean introduced that album. I, the first few bars, I was like, wow. <laughs> People weren't expecting songs. No, they not at all. They were expecting mass noodling mm -hmm. on a sort of, uh, on a biblical scale, mm -hmm. and it wasn't. It was short, uh, straight ahead, melodic songs yep. with the bass lines and, and harmonies, and harmonies all over the place. Fantastic. And you know, the, a lot of that stuff I wrote what the, in the previous thing that I did, which was uh, I did. I always work rather than not work, so I did pick mm -hmm. up gigs. One of the pickup gigs I did was Wishbone Ash in Miami. And I spent six weeks at Criteria Studios. They would work until about six or seven and go for dinner and not come back. Mm -hmm. And I would sit with the beautiful Bosendorfer in Criteria Studios and just write cool. all evening, for the whole evening, mm -hmm. just write. And the engineer would run the tape. And I ended up with really the backbone of Asia's first record. I was immersed in Americana. Mm -hmm. I was listening to the radio all the time. I was living in America. Um, and it all kind of, it was all in the right place at the right time. Then, I sing on the cake. I meet Jeff Downs. Right. And our songwriting is just, you know, it, um, it, it's a marriage made in heaven, really, because we Whatever I come up with, he's got something that matches and not. So you com first. complement each other. We we write in the same vein. Right. We write. He comes from a church background. Uh -huh. So it's there you funny go. that a lot of the choral movements are identical. Mm -hmm. In fact, when we spent the best part of fifteen years apart, and then reconvened in two thousand and six, right? We were comparing notes for the first thing that we would do, and we both written the same. The same song. thing. Same fun. Um, that's amazing. It, it, exactly the same chord sequence. Uh, While we've been apart, the first thing that we concentrate on is something that we've both written, which is extraordinary. You know? And so things like that happen all the time with uh, with Jeff. You know, we um, when we're in a room together for a few hours, we'll we'll come out of it with. I don't know, four, five, six ideas. And, um, usually they'll, they'll be workable ideas mm -hmm. that, that will become songs one way or another. Um, so yeah, it's, a very, it's very fruitful. So I had the stockpile of, of music. You add that to the stuff that Jeff and I uh, created uh, in our first few months together in Asia, and we had a lot of material suddenly. Uh, even though it, it 
it was difficult to go out on tour. We didn't want to delve too far into the mm -hmm. into the catalogue, so we only had 38 minutes of recorded music, which is difficult when you're headlining Montreal Forum. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah, definitely, yeah. <laughs> you know, you could have done with another couple of albums. There. Yeah. Um, we really should have stayed on the road for another four or five years before recording another album. That would have been ideal, but record companies being what they are, and they, by that time, 82, 83, mm -hmm. they were attached to film companies. Yeah. Every, every single from a film became a monstrous album, and that's, that's the way the things went in the 80s. Mm -hmm. And so they wanted more of the same. They wanted, uh, so let's say, uh, uh, Lethal Weapon. Two has to sell more than Lethal Weapon 1, even though Lethal Weapon 1 was a blockbuster. Mm -hmm. Asia 1 was a fucking huge blockbuster. And they were expected the next one to sell more. Well, that's it. You're, it's your own, you're, you're your own enemy, so to speak. Yeah, yeah absolutely. But yeah. I love Joni Mitchell. Absolutely mm -hmm. adore Joni Mitchell. I think she's a goddess. I don't buy everything she puts out. No. End of story. You've got to be able to, to grow and, and get different ideas. Yeah. But what would you prefer, a studio or live? Uh, you need both. Yeah? You need both, yeah. I used to say that I was more of a studio performer, but now I'm not so sure. <laughs> <laughs> you tell me, I'll be well tonight. Well, your last album was Racing Captivity in 2011, yeah. and you've done some work now with, with Asia's, with Gravitas and so yeah. on. What would be next uh, on, on line for you? Another Asia record. Another Asia record? Yeah, yeah. Cool. Right, so. How's it going well with, with Sam? Brilliant. Absolutely yeah. wonderful. He's put a new injection of life into the band and uh, I think we've all risen to it because it was, it was getting a little bit kind of um, predictable. Mm -hmm. uh, Steve had one foot in Asia, one foot in Yes, and he couldn't, he couldn't in all faith continue. So there's no bad feeling at all and we just, uh, we had a short list of two guys, both of whom turned us down. Mm -hmm. Steve Lukather and, um, and uh, Paul Gilbert. And when oh. Paul Gilbert said no, oh, uh, funny that... Right, uh, yes. When Paul Gilbert said no, we said, okay, if you can't, please tell us someone who can. He said, oh, I've got two guys that can do it. Two guys. So um, uh, we looked at both of them and settled on the English guy. Mm -hmm. He's 26, unattached, doesn't smoke, doesn't drink. All important stuff. We don't want another Perfect. car crash like me. No. <laughs> okay, I'll listen. So we do all Asian stuff tonight. Yeah. Uh, it's we, me and <laughs> right. the, the lads, uh, the girls. Um, we do four Asia songs. Um, I think it's, a, it's two from the first album, two from the second. And I think they translate so well to being all mm. it's, it's beautiful. You know. So right. I'm uh, very happy doing this tour. How were you approached to, to do this? And of course, you didn't get to choose the music. They, choose, they chose it for you. They chose the music. They right. would always do. Um, it's, it, it was because my manager also manages Uriah Heap. Okay. And they did it last year. Mm -hmm. And I think through uh, conversations, had it been whole, actually, John did a bit of this. You know, let's see how the Asian tunes there. So that, that's how that came about. I jumped at it. When it was, when it was proposed to me, no. I jumped at it because I always wanted to work that closely with an orchestra. Mm. It's, as I said, you got to stand there just to get the vibe. It's beautiful. It's a lovely thing. One last question, either or. Fishing or skydiving? Skydiving. Skydiving? <laughs> Motorcycle or bicycle? Motorcycle. All right. Cooking or shopping? Ooh. Oh, well, I got you there? Shopping. Shopping, okay. <laughs> Walking or driving? Walking. And last, museum or concert? Ooh, that's a tough one. Uh, museum. Museum. John, thank you. Thank you very much indeed.